Greetings to my brothers and sisters in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us for today's message here at Policy of Baptist Church in Hayward, California, where our pastor is Tommy E. Smith, Jr. I'm delighted to be able to bring this message of hope today. I'm Reverend Anthony Woods, and the message will be delivered out of the Gospel of the Book of John, chapter 15. And in the process of sharing this scripture and sharing this passage, we're going to hope to accomplish two things. And one is to challenge each and every one of you to expand your concept or notion of what it means to be in relationship to God. And the second thing we hope to accomplish today is to be able to, to help you grow or flourish in your relationship with God. And so today, without uh, further ado, what I'd like to do is just start with the text. And I'll be reading out of the King James Version of John chapter 15, beginning at verse 13, you'll find these words. Greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. And verse 16 says, and ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And of, or I have ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. I'm going to ask you, if you where you are, to now to pause for a moment of prayer. Father God in heaven, how we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Father God, that your word is a living word. That, Father God, it is alive, that not only is it a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, but it is the manna from heaven, that which nourishes our spiritual soul. And, Father, as we pray to you today, we're asking that you open our eyes today of what it means to be in relationship to you. What it means, Father God, to have an open and intimate relationship with you, Father God, and to, to look at some of the barriers and challenges to those relationships, Father God. And we're asking you to open our hearts, open our ears, that we may hear the message of life from the word of the Lord today. But Father God, it's in Jesus' precious name we do pray and we thank you. Amen. Amen. And once again, if I could use as a theme or a topic from this particular passage of scripture or scriptures, growing closer to God. Gr growing closer to God. What does it mean to grow closer to God? Now this may seem like an odd subject or an odd set of scriptures to uh, really broach that subject. But, but really, when we begin to talk about what it means to be in relationship to God and what it means to grow closer to God, hopefully and prayerfully, the, 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 the reason for the selection of these, uh, these texts will be apparent. So, so by way of just introduction, we know that we are living in very different times. Some people have called these times uncertain. They have called them changing times. They have called these times troubling times. And we can look back over the past year and say for certain that the things that we've experienced, not only as Christians, but also just as, as a society, that we have experienced things that are unlike anything previously that we've experienced. We, we're talking about rules and mandates now that affect how we worship, when we can gather together and worship, and. Uh, how we go and, and, and go about our daily lives, our social lives, the things that we have gotten accustomed to in terms of our entertainment, our, our food choices, all of those have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And in the midst of that, very often what gets lost in the translation, especially when it comes to the restrictions about how we gather as, as a church family and how we worship God now is what is our relationship to God? How can I possibly grow closer to the Lord when I can't enter the sanctuary and worship like we used to? How can I grow closer to God when I'm not touching uh, those that, that I'm used to fellowshipping with? I, I'm not seeing their smiles. I'm, I'm not holding their hands. And how can we grow closer in a time like this? Well, in this passage, we hope to bring out a few things, but also we're going to be using other texts of Scripture to show just what it is 
to grow closer to the Lord and what some of those barriers or obstacles might be. And the first thing that we see in this text is that in John chapter 15, Jesus began by speaking about his nature. And he talked about it in terms of relationships because he said in John 15 and one, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. And he, he gave us this text to, to speak about the relationship between his role as, as, as the word of God, the living word of God, that which was made flesh and God the father. And to the extent that we can relate to the humanity of Christ. That is, that to the extent that we can relate to the life he lived. We know that he was with God the Father in the beginning, and we know that, that he was indwelling or inhabiting glory, but we also know that he was made flesh, and he came down and did some things that were beyond remarkable. Not only were, were the miracles remarkable, and they, they astonished everyone that, that experienced his miracles, but but Jesus experienced life as we do. And at that, I think, is an overlooked part of it, or aspect of God's glory is the fact that he chose to experience life as we do. And when it comes to growing closer to God, I think sometimes we overlook the fact of Jesus' humanity and the significance of it. So in this text, as he spoke about the relationship between uh, our, our natural relationship uh, with this as men and women of God and, and God the Father. He talked about him being the true vine and God the Father being the husband man. He talked about this relationship and we know that in, in many respects we've grown up to think about our relationship with God. Sometimes we, we, we have concepts of what it means to be in God that, that really are not well developed. And what do I mean by that? I mean no disrespect to anyone but very often we rely on our grandparents or our parents interpretation of what it means to be in relationship with God. And the older generations very often had a, a reverence of God that, that is unmatched and unparalleled. I recall my grandmother, Catherine Woods, often speaking about God in terms of just his magnificence and her being in such a humble state of heart when she was in relationship with him that, that she was always careful to, to make sure that she honored him and she acknowledged his glory, his magnificence, his righteousness. And, but, but what does that mean for someone who hasn't grown up like my grandmother? She grew up in church. Her father was a preacher. And she was indoctrinated about the ways of God. And she grew up in church and she knew church protocol. She knew where to sit. She knew when and when not to talk in church. She knew whether or not it was okay to chew gum in the pew. She knew these things. And one of the things that, that our, our current generation or these youthful generations lack is that, that same sense of acculturation. That is that the, the, the whole purpose of, of, or the role of church in our culture has changed somewhat, and especially now in this COVID time. So as we think about the question, how do we grow closer to God? What can we do to grow and increase our relationship with God? One of the things we have to ask ourselves is, if we were asked, if we were given a survey, or if we were given a, a, an assignment, how would we describe our relationship with God? Will we describe our relationship as one that's loving, kind, caring, and nurturing, that, that God is our protector and we see him as a hiding place, we see him as the champion of our cause, he's our greatest cheerleader. Whenever we are doing something that is worthy of, of comment, he's the first one to, to come and, and to, to cheer us on and, and to let us know how well approved he is of us. Do we have that kind of relationship with God? Do we see him like that or, or do we see God differently? Maybe there's someone out there who sees God a little differently and their relationship because of that is different meaning that they're, they don't have as much of an open relationship with God. Maybe there's somebody out there that has or is contemplating a relationship with God and they say, well, I'm, I'm a sinner. I, I, I've done some very terrible things and how can God want to be close to me? I have everybody in my world around me that's falling away from me. Nobody wants to have anything to do with me. How can God be any different? Or is your relationship with God more transactional? Meaning that we feel that if we come to church, we go to Bible study, we, we give our tithes, our offerings, and in exchange we get eternal life, that is just simply a transaction and that there's no intimacy in that relationship. Well, 
I'd like for you, us to do one thing. For those who, whether you've walked with the Lord for 20 or 30 plus years, whether you have just given your life to Christ, or even if you're just contemplating at this moment, giving your life to the Lord and entering into a relationship with him, I'd like to, to look at some things that, that is apparent in the text about how we should explore what relationship we actually have now. And one of the things that fascinates me is how we very often don't see uh, the, re the relationship or we don't often very much appreciate how God relates to us in terms of our humanity. And in and, and looking at this text, I'm, I'm just amazed that there are some things that, that Jesus took the time to experience. And I mean, he took the time to experience what it was like to be hungry. Now, some people would say, all right, well, look, preacher, all right, we know that he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he hungered, and I can't do 40 days. But there's another passage in Matthew 21 and 8 that talks about Jesus coming from Bethany. And this had nothing to do with fasting. It had nothing to do with 40 days of doing without food. But, but as he entered the city of Bethany, in that text, the Bible said he hungered. And if there's anyone out there who's struggling to, to, to have a close relationship with God because they feel that God doesn't know what it's like to be hungry, that somehow Jesus, who's the Lord and Lord and King of Kings, doesn't know what it's like to experience that sensation in life. Go back and read that text. God knows what it's like to hunger. He knows what it's like to lack. And if you are struggling in your life, about what hunger did to you in your childhood, in your adulthood, if you're struggling to make sense of it and to try to figure out was God there, is, was somehow he not pleased with me, Does this, uh, is this, was that a reflection of my value, my self-worth, go back and understand God took the time through Jesus to experience hunger so that you can relate to him, so that when you are in that state of need, that you can reach out to a God who understands. But it wasn't just hunger that, 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 that maybe we don't seem to, to, to get that, that we can relate to God or God can relate to us in those contexts. We also know that the Lord experienced betrayal. Now, for anyone out there who is struggling to grow close to God because of something that's happened perhaps in a marriage relationship or, or, or a parent-child relationship where something has been done in that relationship to betray your trust, and you feel that there's nobody that can understand, God is trying to let you know in his word, he chose to experience what it was like to be betrayed by Judas. And so if we're trying to go close to God, one of the things that we have to do is we have to appreciate the fact that God can relate to these things. We can talk to him, we can open up and share the troubles of our heart, the difficulties that we're having with these moments because he chose to experience it and he understands. Think about a friend that we have, that we walk on this earth with. We, we share things, we share meals with them, we share life experiences, and we share out of the depths of our heart with our friends. Those are the people that we confide in the most. And could it be that one of the reasons why our relationship with God isn't growing is because we don't see him as being able to relate to these type of experiences? But well, what else did Jesus do? Jesus suffered grief and sorrow. For anyone out there who's struggling with, why did God call my son home? Why did he call my daughter home? Why did he take my wife or my husband away from me? Why did he do this? Why did he allow me to go through these things with my broken heart and my grief and my sorrow? Well, first of all, Isaiah prophesied that in his coming, he would be a man of sorrows, that he would be acquainted with grief. But, but John 11, 35 is... There are many remarkable passages in the scripture, but, but this particular passage finds Jesus in the midst of Jews who were mourning the death of a man named Lazarus, and in the midst of their suffering, in the midst of their mourning and their weeping, God did something remarkable, and when we talk about the glory of God, folks, I, 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 brothers and sisters, I can't stress how mind-blowing this is to me that Jesus would take the time to weep with those that were mourning because of having experienced death or transition in their lives. That of the many things that God is, to, to, and the reasons that he's remarkable to me, is that he would take the time to experience it. If you are struggling 
and don't feel that you can talk to God about what it's like to, to go through these things because you're, you're missing someone in your life that you've walked with all your life. God has said, I went through it so that we can talk about it. I experienced these things so when you came to me, I would have compassion and I would know what it's like. So when you're crying out to me, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. God said that I'm going through these things that you might be made whole. What a remarkable God it is. What a remarkable God that we serve that is willing to experience life as we do so that when we go to him, he'll understand. There's some other things about this, the humanity of Christ that I think that we often overlook when it comes to how we speak to him, how we relate to him, how uh, we, we view our relationship with him. And, and, and as I'm looking at the, the text, I'm also reminded of, of the agony that Jesus experienced. And when we think about agony, think about what it was like for him, meaning Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and asking, if not begging God, to allow something not to happen that he knew was coming down the pipeline. He knew he could not avoid it. Well, we could say for sure it was prophesied. And, and it needed to happen because the world could not be redeemed any other way. But, but imagine going to God with something that is so agonizing that, that as you're praying to God, that you're sweating profusely to the point where it looks like your sweat are big drops of blood. Can you imagine going to God and needing something so badly, being in such agony and, and not being able to know for sure if God understands? He went through that to let us know that he understands our agony, our mental distress, our depression, those things he decided to experience so that when we come to him, he'll know what to say. He'll know how to heal us. He'll know how to, to, to cause peace to come in our lives. This is some of the challenges that we have when we talk about growing our relationship with the Lord because very often we don't talk to God about these things. Very often we don't bring them up and we don't mention them because we don't believe that he can relate to them. But God is saying in his word, I went through it so that I can show you, you can trust me by sharing these things with me. Look at some of the other things that, that he, he felt. And, and these are the last two things that I see in the text when we talk about what it means to be a friend of God. But there are some other things that he experienced in his lifetime. Jesus, the humanity of Jesus, allowed himself to experience betrayal. And as I mentioned before, uh, betrayal is, is the, the sense that you've been the trust and confidence that you have for someone that's, that's been broken and shattered. But when I think about beyond betrayal, what happens to us very often when we fail or we experience betrayal or we experience failure of some sort, we feel like we can't go to God and our relationship with God is limited if we don't feel that we can go to him at times when we simply feel that we are forsaken. Now we, all right, I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'm gonna preach to myself then because I got a feeling that if somebody was here, I, I probably would not get a lot of silence or I would get not a lot of amens and claps. But there have been times in my life when I felt forsaken by God. I found myself in situations where I just had to wonder in my natural mind, God cannot be real if this is happening. This, this simply cannot be a real living God if this chaos is going on in my life. And for anyone that feels like somehow the circumstances of their life, the reason they are experiencing them is because somehow God has forsaken you. That somehow that either because of your guilt, something that you've done that you regret, or because of your shame, the sense that I've now internalized my guilt and I now see myself as a bad person. God has come to deliver us from all the guilt and shame. And he came to let you know that I've been there. When he was on the cross, when he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama na sabachthani, what he was saying was an interpretation of the phrase or expression, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your back on me, Lord? Why can I not find you when I'm in trouble? Why do I have to go through this journey alone? Why am I here by myself? When I turn around and my husband's gone, I look around and my wife has forsaken me. 
Father God, my children, they're gone. I, I, I don't understand what's going on in my life. I turn around and I have nobody in my corner. Jesus wants you to know in those moments, I've experienced that. So one of the things that we can do, saints of God, if we want to grow, if we want our relationship with God to grow, if we want to flourish in our relationship with God, first of all, consider, just consider, opening up your heart and talking to God about the things that you don't talk to anybody else about. Those lonely nights, those moments when you were abused, those moments when you felt forsaken, you felt that you were a failure. Those moments that we don't talk about, we try to hide around, we cover them up the best we can with our degrees and our diplomas and our jobs, our professions, our cars, our houses, our wealth, we cover it up the best way we can. But if you want to grow your relationship and improve your relationship with God, I challenge you to talk to him about the things that you haven't been talking to him about. He gave us an, an example of his humanity to let us know that he's prepared to have those conversations. He's gone through those sick circumstances to let us know that he's prepared to have those talks with you. But in growing our relationship with God, the first challenge is to increase our conversation with him, obviously. But the second thing is, is something that requires something that our pastor preached about last Sunday, and I encourage each and every one of you who hasn't seen Pastor Smith's message on the battle for truth, go check it out. It's in the archives. I'm going to tell you something. There were some powerful, powerful words that came through there about internalizing the word of God. Those are powerful, and it is a battle because in our mind, we know what we've done. We know our failures. More intimately than anyone else, we know where we failed, we've fallen short. We know, for example, we can sit up here and be all pretty if we want to, but we know if our eyes looking over there at the sister over there in the corner or if our, if our eyes wandering on the brother over there with the fine shoes. We know that even though the world doesn't know. So in order to grow in our relationship with the Lord, to, to cause it to flourish even more than what it is, not only should we consider speaking to God about the things that we previously may have thought that he can't relate to or doesn't relate to. But the other thing, the other step is the battle. It's the battle that Pastor Smith spoke about last Sunday and it's about internalizing the truth of God's word. And here is where we are. John 15, beginning at verse 13 in the King James Version, I'll read it again. It says, greater love has no man than this. Now consider what God is saying in this verse. I don't care what kind of love it is. I, I don't care how it's expressed. You can, you can tell somebody you love them. You can buy them a house, a car. You can do all manner of things to express the love that you have. But, but the greatest love or expression of love, he says, greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Now I want you to consider something for just a moment. It's going to take a, a, a measure of faith because our relationship with God, first of all, is a faith-based relationship. We, the Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. But he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We know that, that we're saved by grace through faith. It's not of works. And so, so God gives us text uh, of scripture to let us know that our relationship with him is a faith-based relationship. But, but here, when we come to this point in time about Jesus speaking in John 15 and 13 about greater love has no man than this, than he laid down his life for his friends, that's all good. Except that who's God's friend? Certainly I don't think of myself as God's friend. Why would I do that? Why would I think of myself as a friend of God? And, and there are texts, passages of scripture in the Bible that they, they are beyond astounding to me. I, I believe that David was one time talking about how well God knows him. And he said, he reflected, he said, I, this, this knowledge is too wonderful for me. I cannot attain unto it. And what I'm saying is, is that for God to consider us his friend, I want you to think about the magnitude of that statement. The magnitude of the Lord of Lord and King of Kings, the creator of heaven and earth, not just saying that you, 
brother, and you, sister, are his servant. Because it's one thing to serve one another. It's one thing to serve God. It's one thing to, to have an assignment and, and to feel that we're doing the thing that God wants us to do. That's great. That's good. That's a transactional relationship. But, but, but when we talk about growing our relationship with God, and when we talk about causing it to expand and causing us to grow and see things differently and move differently in God, growing closer to God is going to require us to embrace the truth of God's word where he says in John, he talks about us being his friend. I'm going to read a passage real quickly. It's, it's John chapter 15, verse 15. He said, henceforth, I call you not servants, but the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I've called you my friends. And he also said in 1 John 3 and 1, Behold, what manner of love hath God bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God or the friends of God. What he's saying to us is that I love you and I want to be in an intimate relationship with you like the kind that you would have, you would consider an earthly friendship. Meaning, our earthly friends, those that are in our inner circle, they're the ones that know about us. They're, they know our dirt. They know our faults, our shortcomings. And those are the ones that we confide in. Those are the ones that we get on the phone to at late at night. And we start talking about our husbands or our wife. They are the ones that we get on the phone with and start talking about what's going on in our job, our kids being hard hit. They are the ones that we confide in. And God is saying, if you want to grow your relationship with me, consider not only expanding our conversation in prayer, and be willing to, to speak to me openly about the things that maybe previously you've not thought that I'd be able to relate to. But you're going to have to do something and it may take a battle, it may take a fight, and it may take struggle, but you're going to have to internalize the fact that I call you my friend. You're going to have to internalize the fact that God sees us as his friend and, and that is just remarkable. If, if President Obama said that we were his friend, we would rejoice. Why? I'm going to tell you why. Because wherever Obama goes, we could go. If Steph Curry was our friend, we would rejoice because wherever Steph goes, we could go. Imagine God saying he's your friend. That brother, he says that you are my friend. Sister, you are the friend of God. Can you imagine the places you can go? Can you imagine the things that you can accomplish? Can you imagine the things that you can experience in this expanded relationship? we not only think of ourselves as God's servant, but think of yourself as God's friend. What does it mean to be God's friend? Well, he tells us some things. He said, a friend, uh, a person that has friends must show himself friendly. But the text also tells us that a friend loves at all times. All God wants you to do is have faith and love him. That's all he's asking you to do. And in exchange, He's saying that I am choosing you to be my friend. Brother and sister, I will say this. If there's anyone out there today who has had in the past maybe a long but transactional relationship with God, meaning that you come to church, you pay your tithes and offering, you go to Bible study, and you feel that at the end of that transaction, all you're getting is eternal life. I'm challenging you today that by applying these principles, you can grow closer to God. Consider doing this, brother, sister. Consider speaking and sharing of your heart the things that heretofore have been unspeakable. The things that up to this point in time you've not shared with anyone that you promised yourself you would take to your grave. I challenge you to speak to the Lord about those things because in his humanity, in the context of him coming to the earth and living and ministering for those those. 33 and a half years that he lived and three and a half years of ministry, he lived the human experience so that we can know that he understands. It's no point in praying to God about a broken heart. If you don't know that he stood one day in the temple and said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and he's sent me to heal the brokenhearted. You're not going to pray to God about your broken heart if you don't know that he's anointed and his ministry is to heal your broken heart. God is saying to you, he's saying to me, he's saying to all of us, we can grow closer to him by accepting the challenge of speaking about things 
that we heretofore that we've just not chosen to speak about. Trust God with it. Trust him to know that he's been through it, that he's experienced what you're experiencing. Trust God to know what to say to get you through. And the second part as we grow in our relationship with the Lord, even in a time of a pandemic, consider yourself not just God's servant. You, brother, you, sister, right there, the one that's struggling, the one that's going through the heartache, the one that's crying through this, think of yourself as God's friend. God wants to take you and he wants to embrace you and let you know that there's nothing that he wouldn't do for you. Here's what the text said, and I'll read it in our close. Greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. That's what he's willing to do for you. That's what he's done for you. But it says, you are my friends if you do with us so whatsoever I command you. And henceforth, I will call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my father, I have made known unto you. The mysteries, the deep mysteries of God, the answers that you're seeking, he's telling you in this book, right here in this text, that he's waiting to reveal his mysteries to you. Those answers that you've been seeking all your life are right here. He's ready to reveal them to you because he is your friend. And then finally, I'll, I'll close with this. Jesus said in Matt, uh, I'm sorry, John 15 and 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. I can go home, I can shout, I can tear this pulpit up right now knowing that he chose me. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know as well, for this friendship, God has chosen you to be his friend. Embrace that. Fight against any thought that will come into your mind to think that you're not worthy that somehow you're walking in condemnation. Romans 8.1 tells us we no longer walk in condemnation. God has relieved us from all the burdens of sin. And even more remarkable, 1 John 1 and 9 talks about that if we confess our sin, that Jesus, God, is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, which means that from God's holy, eternal perspective, it's as though it never happened. He even talks about throwing it in, in the sea of forgetfulness. And that's not a text, but it's said, he did say that he would remember our sins no more. Brothers and sisters, I challenge you today. If you're interested in growing your relationship with God, if you're interested in growing closer to God in these times, in these uncertain times, if you're interested at all in doing anything to grow closer to God, I challenge you to do these two things. The first is to open up your heart and speak about the things that you've been holding into yourself all these times. Jesus lived this life on earth to experience it, to let you know that he's ready to talk about it. He understands. And two, embrace the truth that you are God's friend. May God bless the reading, hearing, and doing of his word. We're going to pray. Father God, I pray and thank you right now in Jesus' name that you bless, Lord God, this word. I pray, Father God, that it enters the ears and hearts of those that need it, Lord. That, Father God, something that has been said today would challenge someone to grow closer to you, to share, Father God, something that they have not previously shared in prayer with you. That, Father, they go into their secret closet and they pour out their heart, Father God, and let them know, Father God, that you're their friend. Let them know, Father God, that you care, you love them through it, and you'll help them through it, Lord God. Let them know that you could be trusted as a friend. Your confidence, Lord God, you will not breach their confidence. But mostly, Lord God, let them know that you love them so much that you would give your only begotten son for them. I thank you, Father of God, and I praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you all. I pray that this message has been encouraging.